عظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمصابنا بإمامنا أمير المؤمنين وسيد الموحدين علي بن أبي طالب I extend to you my sincerest condolences on this very tragic night as we have gathered to commemorate the legacy of our Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Such a night was very heavy on the family of Ahl bayt For them to lose the foremost defender of Islam after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always grant us the wilaya of Amir al muminin to grant us the shafa'ah of Amir al muminin and to grant us the ziyarah of Amir al muminin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Mujadila verse 12. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu, idha najaytum ar-rasoola, فَقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ نَجْوَاكُمْ صَدَقَ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَأَطْهَرٌ فَإِنْ لَمْ تَجِدُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمٌ Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. اللهم صلى الله عليه وسلم Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi occupied a very high status in his community. There were members of his community who would go and privately meet the Prophet in order to show that they were important. And usually they were the rich ones. The rich ones in Medina, they would spend time speaking privately to the Prophet ﷺ. When you privately speak to someone and you whisper to them, in Arabic, this is called Najwa. Now this made them feel important. I'm spending time with the Prophet ﷺ. The poor people would also have access to the Prophet. They would go and see him privately. But the rich ones felt more entitled. That's the nature of our societies. People who have, people who are well off, people who are rich, usually they feel more entitled than the average citizen in society. Isn't it so? Even until today, you will find that certain, in certain communities, rich people, they think they, ha they should have more privileges. They should have more access to resources than others. And they should get special treatment. Rich people always are trying to get special treatment, right? For instance, you go to the airport, there's a dedicated line for those who pay more. There's business class, there's a lounge. And that's natural in most societies, that is the case. So at that time, the rich people, they felt that they should have more access to the profit. And so they would spend more time Privately speaking to the Prophet ﷺ, whispering to the Prophet, getting a private meeting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to try them. Allah wanted to try the companions. Many of these companions, by getting a private meeting with the Prophet ﷺ, they felt important. They wanted probably to even show off. See, I have a private meeting with the Prophet sallallahu Allah decides to put them to the test. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala command them to do? Allah reveals verse 12 of Surah Al-Mujadila. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu. O you believers, meaning you Muslims. There is a new law right now. We've got new rules here. If you want to see the Prophet. What are the new, law, the new laws? What are the new rules? You can still see the Prophet privately. Now you have to give sadaqah. You have to give charity. It's no longer free for you to see the Prophet privately. 
You want to see him privately? You have to donate to the poor. You have to give charity. Not money for the Prophet himself, but to the poor. Sadaqah. The Quran then states, This is better for you, and it brings you more purification of the heart. Why? It brings purification to the rich people because the rich people usually are attached to their money. They're attached to their wealth. So the Quran is teaching them, give some of that wealth as charity. This will purify your heart. It's good for you. You can still come and see the Prophet privately. You're welcome to get a private meeting with him. However, now you have to pay. This is good for you. It will purify your heart. As for the poor people, it's also purification for you as well. Because yesterday you would be bothered when you would see the rich people having more access to the Prophet. Today, less rich people are going to go and see the Prophet because now there's a tax that you have to pay. So this will make you feel more equal with the rich. Now, the Quran also recognizes there are poor people who do not have anything to give. Obviously, you don't want to deny them to see the Prophet privately, sometimes they would have an important matter that needed to be discussed privately with the Prophet So the Quran makes an exception. If you're really poor to the point where you cannot give any sadaqah, when you meet the Prophet, Allah will forgive you. He's merciful. So this verse is now revealed in Medina, imposing a tax on seeing the Prophet privately. Guess what happens? Previously, before this verse, the Prophet was in very high demand. So many people wanted to see him. His companions would take the private time of the Prophet. And the Prophet's time was very valuable because it made them feel important. Now that you have to pay to see the Prophet, everyone stopped seeing Rasulullah. Those companions who were seeing the Prophet Day in, day out, they stopped. The Prophet was in high demand yesterday. Today, no one wants to, do, to see the Prophet anymore. So all the companions stopped seeing the Prophet privately, except one man. And that is the one whom you're commemorating tonight. The only one who came forward and he gave sadaqah to see the Prophet was Abu Hassan Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And there is consensus on this by the Sunni and the Shia. For instance, if you look at the Sunni books of Tafsir, look at Fakhr al-Razi, look at Al-Qurtubi, look at the common books of Hadith. Amir al-Mu'mineen has a beautiful Hadith. He states there is an ayah in the Holy Quran. I am the only one who implemented it. No one before me implemented it and no one after me implemented it. And that's the verse of Najwa. The verse of the whispering or the private meaning with the Prophet ﷺ. Because when Allah revealed this verse, none of the companions came to see the Prophet. I was the only one. I had a dinar. A dinar is a golden coin. I went, I exchanged the dinar for 10 dirhams. A dirham is a silver coin. And every day for 10 days, I went to see the Prophet ﷺ and I gave a dirham. Now this verse creates a dilemma for many schools of thought. Because many schools of thought are adamant and insisting that all the companions of the Prophet were great, at a high status, we should follow all of them. The verse of Najwa really exposed many intentions in Medina. The Prophet was in high demand. Now that you have to pay, you're not willing to see the Prophet? What happened? Where is your Iman? Where is your love for the Prophet? Do you love money more than Rasulullah? This is a verse in the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters. You be the judge here. You, the first Khalifa who is, who is going to lead this Ummah, now that you have to pay a tax, suddenly you don't want to see the Prophet You don't have any questions to ask him. You're going to be the Khalifa of this Ummah. There's nothing you want to discuss with him. 10 days, nothing, no interest, subhanallah. None of them came forward to see the Prophet except Amir al muminin And this was one of the great virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib, such that Ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, look at Az-Zamakhshari, look at 
For instance, Al-Qurtubi, they've narrated this hadith. He says, Abu Al-Hasan, Ali ibn Abi Talib has three qualities. I'd rather have them than to have the world. I'd rather have these three qualities than having Humr and Na'am, which were the red-haired camels. They were very special in Arabia, very expensive. He's saying, I'd rather have those qualities than to have the world, than to have something valuable. The first one, Tazweejuhu Fatima binti Rasulullah. The first virtue is the Prophet did not allow any companion to marry his daughter Fatima except Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's the first one that I really envy Imam Ali for having this quality. The second one, I'ta'uhu raya yawma khaybar. The second one is that the Prophet gave him the banner at Khaybar when he achieved the victory. The third one, Ayatul Najwa and the verse of Najwa. This shows us that the companions realized that this verse elevated the status of Imam Ali salam in the eyes of everyone. It became very clear that Amir al muminin is really the only sincere one to that extent who was always desperate to be with the Prophet. Even if I have to give sadaqah. By the way, you know what's tragic even more? The Quran did not specify how much you have to give. The Quran says sadaqah. Even if it was something small, it was acceptable. Allah did not impose a huge amount of money to see the Prophet. One dirham. What's one dirham? That's not a lot of money. Ten dollars, twenty dollars. Many people can afford that. It's not going to change your life if you donate $20 and see the Prophet ﷺ. But subhanAllah, they failed that test. For 10 days, every day, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he's the only one who shows up. Suddenly now, no one wants to see Rasulullah. It was a very difficult trial. We have a beautiful hadith that gives us a glimpse of some of the questions of Imam Ali alayhi salam to the Prophet during those 10 days. One hadith tells us that Imam Ali salam, on the first day, he went to the Prophet. He gave the one dirham as sadaqah. He told him, Ya Rasulullah, tell me, ma huwa wafa What is loyalty? Today, when you think of loyalty, what comes to your mind? You know what the Prophet responded? He told him, Al wafa at tawheed, shahada to Allah ilaha illallah. Look at the response of the Prophet. He tells him, you're asking me about loyalty? Loyalty is tawheed, to bear witness that there is no God but Allah. How is tawheed related to loyalty? Allah is the one who created you. Allah is the one who sustained you. Allah is the one who blessed you and he's given you everything. The least that you can do to show loyalty to Allah is to worship him and to obey his laws and commands. That's true tawheed. Anytime we commit a sin, Honestly, we're being disloyal to Allah. Imagine if you have a company and you're well off and a person comes to you asking for help and you help him for 50 years. You buy him a house, you buy him a car, you give him access to education, you give him whatever he wants and then he goes and he works with your enemy against you. How would you feel? How would you feel if that were to happen? You would feel betrayed. You would feel backstabbed. You know, we do this every day with Allah. Allah is the one who's created you. He's sustained you. He's given you everything. Every day we go and we help the enemy of Allah against the law of Allah. That's not wafa. You know, sometimes when you think of sins, it's not that this is a desire, do this, don't do that. Think of a higher level. Why should I sin when Allah has given me everything? When he's blessed me, why should I sin? When he's been loyal to me, why should I sin? An act of sinning is betraying the law of God. You're betraying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you're using his resources to disobey him. It's his resources. Imagine if I give you a gift, you use that gift against me. How inappropriate is that? Everything we have is from Allah. So he teaches him that true Tawheed is Wafa. You want to be loyal? Be loyal to your Lord before anyone else. There's a beautiful narration that has been reported 
that once Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, after he ascended to the kingdom and to power, one day he was sitting, he saw a young man who looked very poor with very old clothes passing by. Jibra'il was there visiting Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Yusuf asked Jibra'il, he told him, who's this man? Jibra'il told him, you didn't recognize him? He said, no, who is he? He says, he's that boy who testified in your favor to save you from the accusation of Zuraikha. Because when they were fleeing her room, they met her husband at the door. She got scared. She told her husband, what's the punishment for the one who tried to harass your wife? He said, no, I'm innocent. I did not do that. How do you prove it now? And he's a slave owned by her. Who's going to listen to his testimony? There was a boy over there, a young boy, a baby boy, related to Zulaikha from her ahl, from her relatives. Allah commanded him to speak. What did Allah command that boy to speak? He told the husband, he told him, look at the shirt of Yusuf. If you see the shirt of Yusuf being torn from the front side, that means he's the one who tried to attack her and harass her. But if you see that the shirt is torn from the backside, that means she's the one who was chasing him. So when he saw that the shirt of Prophet Yusuf was torn from the back, he realized that she was accusing him. Jibra'il tells Prophet Yusuf, that young boy now has grown up, but he has no one to take care of him. Prophet Yusuf said, let's bring him and honor him. He gave him the best of clothes. He gave him money and he put him on a monthly salary. Jibra'il asked Prophet Yusuf, why did you honor him like that? He says, because he has a haq on me. He has a right over me. Because he testified in my favor. Of course I have to be good to him. Jibra'il smiled. He told him, why did you smile? Did I do something wrong? I should have given him more or less. He says, no, I smiled because you, the creation of Allah, you Yusuf, you gave so much for the one who did shahada for you. He testified in your favor. I am right now thinking of all those who say, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, what will Allah give them for that testimony? When you truly testify that there is no God but Allah, that's a testimony you're giving for Allah. Allah will reward you. That's why one of the greatest deeds that you can do is to say the shahada and to truly observe it in your life. You're about to sin? No, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. You're about to violate someone's rights? No, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. That's wafa. That's amazing wafa. So this was one of the questions that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, asked the Prophet. Another question, he asked him, Malhila. For those of you who are familiar with the Arabic language, what does Hila mean? Hila is a scheme that you come up with to achieve something. And usually it's hidden ways, hidden strategies that you employ to achieve something. We call this Hila in Arabic. So he asked the Prophet ﷺ, what's the best Hila? If I really want to achieve something, even if someone is plotting against me, what's my hila? The Prophet tells him, the best hila is tarkul hila. The best hila, the best scheme is not to have a scheme. The best plot is not to plot. Subhanallah. Look at these words from Ahlul Bayt. Only such amazing advice comes from the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Many times there might be some people plotting against you. You're trying to achieve something. We take crooked paths, hidden ways. A mu'min is always honest. There is no crooked paths with a mu'min. There's no hidden strategies involved. A mu'min is honest. You can feel safe with a mu'min. And Allah will give you your haq. Just a few months ago, I was in the holy city of Najaf. There was a driver who would take me from Najaf to Karbala for ziyara. So one day I realized that he was a little bit depressed. I asked him, what's wrong with you? He said, say this evil person, you know, he came up with a way to steal money from me, to take money from me. 
He said, I was driving and he was on a motorcycle, that other person. And he deliberately crashed into my car. Not a severe crash, but he bumped into my car and he fell down. So obviously I took him to the hospital because I felt bad for him. When I took him to the hospital and the police came to file a report to see what happened, he accused me of stealing his money. He said, when I was on my motorcycle, I had $4,000 in my pocket. So he stole it. Just an accusation. I said, what do you mean? There's no evidence of that. He said he went and he brought his ashira, his tribe. <laughs> I told him, what are you going to do? He works so hard to make some money, this taxi driver. I personally know him. He really works hard. He helps his brothers. He helps his father, his aging father. He works day and night. He said, we met the tribe, you know, his family, and we came to a settlement to give him $2,000. I told him, why are you giving it? Go and dispute it. He said, Sayyid, it's not worth it to go to the court system, and then tomorrow they might threaten me, his family members might threaten me. I've left it up to Allah to give me back my haq. You would not believe what happened. Last month, last month, he was taking me to Karbala. He looked shocked. He told me, Sayyid, do you know what happened? I told him what happened. He said, that person who stole the money from me. By the way, when he was telling me and I was giving him patience, I told him, don't worry. You think he's going to enjoy that $2,000? By Allah, he's not going to enjoy it. So when I met him, he told me, Sayyid, yesterday, yesterday, he had a heart attack and he died. 30 years old. Allahu Akbar. Was it worth it now? You stole so many people. And at the end of the day, your ajal, your time came like that. And by the way, he wasn't happy. He's a good man, the taxi driver. He's like, say, Wallah, I'm not happy. I'm sad. He has orphans. I'm sad that he died. But subhanAllah, he did not enjoy the money more than two months. Two months gone. The best hila is tarkul hila. See, he left it up to Allah. Now imagine if he had gone to court and spent so much money on this lawyer and that lawyer and then got in trouble with his family. He said, I'll leave it up to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him. He got him out of it, but that other person had to pay the price for this act of embezzlement and stealing. The best hila is tarkul hila. The best scheme, the best plot is not to plot against anyone. Leave it up to Allah. You know what the hadith Qudsi says? Allah says, when I see my servant, my abid, the mu'min, and he is violated, he's oppressed. If he goes to defend himself, Allah says, I don't step in. He will take his haq. He's defending himself. But when the mu'min does not defend himself and he leaves it up to me, I will personally defend him. Your personal lawyer is Allah. Your personal lawyer is Allah. And he's the best of lawyers. And many, many cases prove that, my dear brothers and sisters. So these were some of the conversations that the Prophet ﷺ was having with Imam Ali. Imam Ali wanted the knowledge of Rasulullah. he take advantage of every minute. So none of the companions came to see the Prophet except Abu Hassan Amir al muminin alayhi salam. Allah rebukes the companions. Verse 13 of Surah Al Mujadala. أَأَشْفَقْتُمْ أَن تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ نَجْوَاكُمْ صدقات. Ha, Ya sahaba, ya companions. You're scared, you're concerned of giving some sadaqah to the Prophet to see him? Where did, you, where did your big claims go? Were the sahaba of the Prophet, were this, were that? that I don't know what he is. Where, what happened to them? One sadaqah you cannot give to the Prophet. The Quran rebukes them. أَأَشْفَقْتُمْ أَن تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ نَجْوَاكُمْ صَدَقَاتٍ But then the Quran says, فَإِذْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَتَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Now that you didn't, Allah has forgiven you. Do you know how Allah forgave them? Imam Ali says, Imam Ali says, by Allah, if I had not gone and given that donation and seen the Prophet, Allah would have sent his curse on this ummah and destroyed everyone in it. Through Imam Ali, Allah forgave all those companions. Imam Ali has a right upon every single companion. Imagine Rasulullah, the final Prophet, 
Just because now you have to pay some money, you're not going to see him? This is an insult to Rasulullah. This is an insult to Islam. Imam Ali salam says, if it weren't for me, Allah would have sent his punishment. So Allah did forgive them, but because of who? Because of Imam Ali salam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after 10 days, he lifted. He lifted that command. Now you can go and see the Prophet without sadaq. I just wanted to test you for 10 days. And truly Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam stands out. When we commemorate him tonight, we are not commemorating him because he's related to us or we're fanatics or we have something to benefit personally. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed him to be our guide. Because he was the closest to Rasulullah. Now there's a very important lesson that we learn from Amir al-Mu'mineen on this night. Imam Ali teaches us, you donate and give for the sake of Allah and for the sake of your community, for the sake of the poor, for the, for the sake of charities. Today we live in a society, my dear brothers and sisters, the spirit of ayat and najwa must be present amongst us. How much are we willing to give for our deen? How much? Look at other groups, other religious groups, how much they're giving. Here in Canada, there are 30,000 Christian congregations and they have a total of 27,000 churches. How many? 27,000 churches. In the U.S., do you know how many churches there are? Over 300,000 churches. 300,000 churches. And some of those churches are huge mega churches. You've seen them. They spend, other groups spend. When it comes to religious education, do you know how many colleges in the U.S. there are? that were established by Christians and religious groups, 900 colleges and universities in the US established by Christians and religious groups. Allah has given us resources. We as Muslims here in the West, how much are we giving to build Islamic schools? How much are we investing in Islamic colleges, Islamic seminaries, sponsoring some of our children to go to the Hausa? This is something every community needs. Here in Halifax, you have to get together and sponsor two, three of your children. Tell them, we'll sponsor you. We'll send you to the Hausa. Tomorrow, you have to be our future scholars. And Toronto needs to do the same. Ottawa needs to do the same. Montreal needs to do the same. Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary. That's how you save the future of your generation. But this requires sacrifice. This requires that we sponsor them. We support them. Are we doing that? We should. We need to think along these lines. That's how we truly show our faith, by giving more to our community, by giving more to our centers. And the verse of Najwa is the best lesson that we have on such a night, my dear brothers and sisters. That's the spirit of this verse. We need to invest in our communities more than anything, more than anything. The money I spend on my car and on my house, that will be gone, believe me. In the grave, that's not going to help me. On the day of judgment, that is not going to help me. My property, my land, my stock market, that's not going to help you. It's a limited investment you benefit from a few years in this dunya. It's the sadaqa jariya, the acts of charity that you give. When you build a strong community, when you donate to your community, when you spend for your religion, that's what will give you an eternal investment until the day of judgment. This is the spirit of this ayah that we must learn from tonight, on my dear brothers and sisters. Imam Ali teaches you sacrifice, give. Allah will appreciate that. Let's not be like those companions who when Allah put them to the trial, no, I don't want to give. This is the lesson of Abu al-Hasan, Amir al-Mu'mineen. But you know, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, even though he'd spend on everyone, the Imam, when it came to himself, he had very strict standards for himself. No poor man would pass by Amir al-Mu'mineen without getting something from him. But the Imam, he was very harsh on himself because he was the Khalifa, the leader. He wanted the poor who suffered, who slept hungry, to know that they have an imam who shares their pain. That's why we love Amir al-Mu'mineen. We love his sincerity. We love his humbleness. 
on this night, we cherish these values. One day, a man, a Arabi, comes to Kufa. He comes to Masjid al-Kufa. He sees an elderly man. And this Arabi was hungry. He tells the elderly man, do you have some food to share with me? That elderly man gives him some food. But the Arabi realizes the quality of the food is not really the best. It's barley bread, which is very hard and coarse. And it's not easy to chew it and eat it. So he took the bread from this elderly man. And he was appreciative. But he realized that he needs some better food. This is too hard for him to eat. And this is not going to fully, you know, satiate his hunger. So when he goes inside Kufa, he learns that Imam Hassan and Hussein opened their house to any poor person. And they are the most generous in Kufa and they give really good food. This Arabi, this traveler, this Bedouin, he goes to the house of Imam Hassan and Hussein and he gets the best food. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. He goes to the house of Al Imam Al Hassan, of Al Imam Al Hussein, Sayyidai Shababi Ahl Al Jannah. They notice he does something unusual. He eats, he's full now. They realize he's taking extra food with himself, like hiding it. Imam Al Hassan comes up to him. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Imam Al Hassan comes to him. He tells him, Oh man, we realize that you're sneaking the food out. Why? If you want more food, just tell us. Do you have someone, do you have a family member that you want to give this food to? He said, I'm taking this food because I saw an elderly man in Masjid al-Kufa. And I asked him for food, he gave me his food. And his food was barley bread that was so hard I could not eat. So I'm sneaking this food, not for me. I'm not stealing, but I want to go and to give it to that man. Because this is good food here. I want to share it with that elderly. Imam Hassan and Hussein, they break into tears. They told him, did you recognize who that man was? He says, no, I don't know him. They tell him, that's our father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's Amir al Even the poor man felt bad for what he eats. And his sons are the most generous in society. What a family. What a family. That's Amir al Mu'mineen. This is Amir al Mu'mineen who truly teaches us how to be close to Allah, how to prepare ourselves for the day of judgment. Every night in Kufa, Amir al Mu'mineen would sit in his mihrab despite his many activities, fatigued, tired, but this was his special moment with his Lord, his special moment with Allah. And he, was, he would recite those beautiful munajat. The words of Amir al-Mu'mineen, they bring peace to our hearts. They bring iman to our hearts. They truly teach us how to prepare. Take your hearts now to the mihrab of Amir al-Mu'mineen in Kufa. This mihrab had a special relationship with the imam. The imam would sit at night and he would speak some of these words. You know what the imam would say? Allahumma inni as'aluka al-aman Oh Allah, I ask you for safety. Amir al-Mu'mineen is asking for security and safety. Oh Imam, for which day do you ask for safety and security? Allahumma inni as'aluka al-aman Yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la Oh Allah, I ask you for aman and safety. On which day? On that day, your children, your wealth, nothing from this dunya will help you. What will help you? 
except the one who comes with a pure, sound heart. A pure heart on the day of judgment will save you. وَأَسْأَلُكَ الْأَمَانِ يَوْمَ يَعُضُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِ اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ الرَّسُولِ سَبِيلًا The Imam says, I ask for aman on that day when you will bite at your hands, meaning a sign of regret. Why didn't I follow the Qur'an? Why didn't I follow the path of truth? Why did I befriend those good, bad people and not the good people? I saw the haq, but my bad friends, they misled me. On such a night, make a commitment to protect yourself. Our dear youth, surround yourselves with good friends and keep away from bad friends. Bad friends will eventually destroy your life. يوم يفر المرء من أخيه وأمه وأبيه وصاحبته وبنيه لكل امرئ منهم يومئذ شأن يغنيه Oh Allah, I ask you for aman on that day. You will run away from your brother on the day of judgment. Your mother, your father, you go to your mother, mother, please give me one of your hasanat. She tells you, Habibi, I need the hasanat more than you do. On that day, it's you and your deeds. No one can help us on that day. فَيُؤْخَذُ بِالنَّوَاصِي وَالْأَقْدَامِ وَأَسْأَلُكَ الْأَمَانِ يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ الظَّالِمِينَ مَعْذِرَتُهُمْ وَلَهُمْ سُوءُ الْلَعْنَةِ وَلَهُمْ سُوءُ الْعَذَابِ Then the Imam connects with his creator. Tonight is Laylatul Qadr. Connect to Allah like Amir al-Mu'mineen would connect to Allah. مولاي يا مولاي أنت المولى وأنا العاب وهل يرحم العبد إلا المولى Oh Allah, you are the master and I am the slave and who other than the master can have mercy on the slave مولاي يا مولاي أنت القوي وأنا الضعيف وَهَلْ يَرْحَمُ الضَّعِيفَ إِلَّا الْقَوِيمِ Oh Allah, you are the strong and I am the weak. And who other than the strong can have mercy on the weak? مولاي يا مولاي أنت الجواد وأنا البخيل وَهَلْ يَرْحَمُ الْبَخِيلَ إِلَّا الْجَوَادِ Oh Allah, you are the generous and I am the stingy and who other than the generous can have mercy on the stingy. Yes, this was the nightly a'mal of Amir al-Mu'mineen in Masjid al-Kufa in his mihrab. But oh believers, now I want you to take your hearts on such a night to the mihrab of Amir al-Mu'mineen. <laughs> on such a night, the mihrab of the Imam is quiet. The Imam no longer has the energy to come to the masjid and sit in his mihrab. Tonight is the last night in the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen. The Imam alayhi salam, he gathers his family, he gathers Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein and the members of Bani Hashim to give his final will. Now we'll spend these moments listening to the final will of Amir al-Mu'mineen. أوصيكما بتقوى الله وأن لا تبغي الدنيا وإن بغتكما. My dear sons Hassan and Hussein, my will to you is to always be mindful of Allah and not to run after this dunya, even if the dunya runs after you. ولا تأسف على شيء زوية عنكما. Don't ever be sad if something from this dunya you don't achieve, you don't get. Something is taken away from you. You lose some money, you lose your job. It's okay. You have Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. 
Then the Imam السلام, continues to give them their advice. وَكُونَا لِلظَّالِمِ خَصْمَيًا وَلِلْمَظْلُومِ عَوْنًا And always be an opponent to the oppressors and be a supporter to those who are oppressed. These are the last words of Amir al-Mu'mineen and yet the Imam cares about justice. Allah, Allah fil aytam Fala taghubbu afwaahahum Wala yadi'u bi hadratikum be mindful of Allah when it comes to the orphans. The Imam is struck. He can barely speak. But the heart of Amir al muminin is with the orphans. He thinks about the orphans. He says to his family, make sure you take care of the orphans. No one harasses them after me. They are in good hands after me. Allah, Allah fil Qur'an فَلَا يَسْبِقُكُمْ إِلَى الْعَمَلِ بِهِ غَيْرُكُمْ O oh, Muslims, be mindful of your Qur'an. Make sure that non-Muslims don't practice the Qur'an before you do. You be the first ones to implement the Qur'an before anyone else. Allah, Allah fil فَإِنَّهَا عَمُودُ دِينِكُمْ be mindful of Allah when it comes to your salah. It is the pillar of your faith. Brothers and sisters, let's take our salah more seriously. Your imam was struck while he was in his salah. This is your leader. Let's show more importance to our daily salah. Allah, Allah fi islahi dhati baynikum fa'inni sami'tu jaddakuma rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi yaqool صلاح ذات البين خير من عامة الصلاة والصيام. The Imam is asking us to bring reconciliation, make peace between two people. You know, two people in the community who are not on good terms, make peace between them. Imam Ali says to his sons, I heard your grandfather Rasulullah state, if you make peace between two people, that has more ajr, more reward than all of fasting and praying. These are the words of Amir al Mu'mineen. Allah, Allah fi ahli bayt Then Amir al Mu'mineen says to his community, Be mindful of Allah when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt. Do not oppress my, the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Do you know what they did to your son Hassan? Do you know what they did to your son Hussein? Allahu Akbar. Now these are the final moments. Amir al muminin is lying on the ground. Lady Zainab salam approaches him. She realizes the Imam on the sides of his forehead, the Jabin. The Imam was sweating. She tells him, Oh Father, why do I see you sweating? What's happening over here? He tells her, Bunaya Zainab, Lakat Samir to Jeddeki Rasulallah, he a cool in Al Mu'mina, Ida Nazalabihil Mount, Wadanat Wafatu Arika Jabino, Wasakana Anino. Zainab, I heard your grandfather say, that when the believer is about to die, the sides of his forehead begin to sweat. Zainab, these are my final moments. She begins to cry. How, she, how will she fare well her father, Amir al Mu'mineen? Yes, O believers. Then he calls on Hassan and Hussein, alayhim as salam. He tells them, This is my final word. I want you to put me in my kafan and I want you to embalm me with the kafur of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Then when you put me in the casket, on one side you carry the casket, but on the other side, follow the casket, see where it will lead you. You know, you know who carried the casket? Jibra'il and Mikail. They came to carry the casket of Amir al Mu'mineen. He tells them, Follow the casket, it will take you to a place, a grave that was prepared by Prophet Nuh before the, the flood. You know where Imam Ali is buried? Prophet Nuh is buried and Prophet Adam is buried. They will, the, the casket is going to show you the way to my grave in Najaf, and that's where you will bury me. So he gives his final will, and then, oh believers, he said, he looks at his children. أحسن الله لكم العزاء ألا وإني منصرف عنكم وراحل في ليلتي هذه 
ولاحق بحبيبي رسول الله. My dear family, you have to be patient. Tonight is my last night. Tonight is my last night. I have to leave, and I am going to meet Habibi Rasulullah, my brother Rasulullah. Yes, they would see the Imam. He'd lose consciousness, then he'd wake up. He'd lose consciousness. The poison was destroying the body of Amir al Mu'minin. He was in a lot of pain, Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam. Then suddenly, they saw Amir al Mu'minin speaking to them by saying, Hada akhi Rasulullah, wa hada ammi Hamza, wa hada akhi Ja'far, wa haula ashabu Rasulullah, yakuluna ya Ali, ajjil ilayna, laqad ishtakna ilayk. Imam Ali says, right now I see Rasulullah, they're present at the moment of death. I see my uncle Hamza, my brother Ja'far, I see the companions of the Prophet. They tell me, oh Ali, come to us, we miss you. Then the Imam begins to look at the angels. Here comes the tragedy, oh believers, are you ready for the tragedy of your Imam? Assalamu alaikum, ya Rasul Rabbi. Peace be upon you, O angels. The Imam says, everyone, you should be prepared for such a day. I see heaven before me right now. Everyone, you should be prepared like I was prepared. Then, O believers, the Imam, he stretches his hand and his feet. And the Imam says the Shahadatain, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Amir al Mu'minin closes his eyes and he departs this dunya. Rahim Allah, man nada wa imama. Aywa Aliya, Aywa Mazluma, Abu Hussein, Ma Tamam Siyama, Ajal Eid Ola Daita. Imam Imam Ali could not complete the fast of the month of Ramadan. The day of Eid comes, and everyone wants to celebrate with their family. But Zainab, she lost her father. They wanted to celebrate Eid with their father, Amir al-Mu'mineen, but his sons became orphans. They did not have their father to celebrate Eid with them. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون يا علي انت اللي كل ما تبتلي تروي الزمن أحسن